Good afternoon. I decided if I'm going to take on a topic as weighty as the meaning of life, I had better start with a joke. And so um, the joke goes like this. The meaning to life is 42. That is 101010 in binary code. This is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. In nerd culture, the number selected by Douglas Adams in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was the result of 7.5 million years of number crunching by supercomputer Deep Thought. But by the time it got the answer, nobody knew what the question was any longer. So here's Douglas Adams sitting there as a writer and totally bemused by what happened in nerd culture from what he wrote. And I have a, a, a apropos verse from a Paul Simon song. You want to be a writer? You don't know where or when? Think it up and write it down. Use a humble pen. That's from Hurricane's Eye by Paul Simon. Douglas Adams has been quoted as saying, It was a joke. I sat at my desk, staring at the garden, and thought, 42 will do. I typed it out. End of story. <laughs> so, um, so 42 it is, but uh, in terms of uh, why we're here today, uh, I wanted to share with you what first brought it up. Um, I was listening to a audio or a videotape on YouTube that was, Is There Meaning to Life? Uh, which was a convocation at Wycliffe College at the University of Toronto on January 26, 2018. And I turned it on to where Dr. Peterson was speaking, and um, and I came up with him presenting this meaning. Um, being is suffering, tainted by malevolence. So what is the meaning? There is pain to alleviate. There is chaos to confront. There is order to establish and revivify. And there is evil to constrain, not the least in our own hearts. And that's meaning enough for everyone. Well, I didn't find uh, I didn't find that very satisfying, and um, so I right away decided I'd be interested in thinking about what the meaning of life is and how to present it um, to an audience, and so um, I'll tell you in a minute. How, how my wife reacted to uh, Dr. Peterson's comment. Um, but in any case, uh, this convocation at Wycliffe College uh, really got my motor running. And it, I found that as soon as I started thinking about the meaning of life, immediately uh, many uh, things started to come to my attention uh, about the meaning of life. And so what I want to do is first, I want to present a variety of quote meanings of life as they are presented by various thinkers over time. And I'll also talk about the three thinkers that were in this convocation at Wycliffe College. And then I'll give you Dr. Young's rather complex uh, definition of the supreme meaning. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about um, 
others. And meanwhile, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm uh, going to present these to you. Uh, I'm not going to stop until I get through the others. And then I'll stop and ask for comments uh, from the audience. Uh, and then um, once we've had a discussion, uh, then I'm going to give you what Dr. Jung said, and then we can have a further discussion. And uh, I think that you'll be surprised at the very, in the end, very simple uh, meaning of life that Dr. Jung gives you. Uh, but first, um, here's a famous quote uh, of Dr. Jung about the meaning of life. He said, meaninglessness inhibits fullness of life and is therefore equivalent to illness. He meant mental illness, of course. Um, whilst meaning has an inherent curative power, meaning makes a great many things endurable, perhaps everything. Okay, so that's uh, that's where I was starting because that's the quote that I could remember before getting embarking on this process to prepare for this Q and A. Um, but there are a few others. Um, there's Albert Einstein said, "What is the meaning of life or organic life altogether?" To answer this question at all implies religion. Is there any sense, then, you may ask, in putting it? I answer the man who regards his own life and that of his fellow creatures as meaningless is not only unfortunate, but almost disqualified for life. And that's from Albert Einstein, The World as I See It. And... Uh, then there's a very interesting quote from James Hillman. He said, Reality is the fantasy we tell ourselves when we want to talk about reality. And so I think that Dr. Hillman uh, was talking about the fact that we, when we look at our hand or something like, or anything else that's of the substantive world, uh, we're actually looking at reflections uh, off of um, atoms that are very small indeed and very far apart. Um, so I, now I want to go back um, to this uh, Wycliffe College, Is There Meaning to Life? Which, uh, sadly, it wasn't really about the meaning to life. And... Uh, Please uh, say hello. Hi, Miles. Uh, thank you for joining uh, today. And uh, if, if you're uh, here, please uh, say hello in the chat. I'll come back to the chat in a little bit. So here's why this Wycliffe College uh, session was so um, weird to me. First of all, it morphed into a discussion of morality and religion and not um, and, uh, and not the meaning to life. But uh, Professor Peterson, Jordan Peterson, I've been following for a few months. Uh, I actually learned of him through a psychoanalyst I know. And um, his whole approach was on the order of what do you say to a dying child? And I treated this as the Eeyore approach. And Eeyore is misspelled here, so there it is. Um, the Eeyore approach. Uh, because it implies the truth is bad and sad. And I'm not very satisfied by that, and I'm not very satisfied by his little poem, um, and so I'll describe to you what came next. But the other two speakers at this event were Professor Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, or I'm not sure if she's a professor, she's a philosopher and author, and she believes there's no metaphysics, 
And she said, basically says different strokes for different folks. Everybody can have a different meaning to life. Uh, I think Dr. Jung would basically agree with that, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and she says nothing supernatural exists. Well, seems to me that's probably design, denying what physicists have already uh, discovered, which is that there are at least, I think, 11 dimensions they talk about now. But, uh, but her point is, how do we avoid squandering this one life we get? And uh, she says she takes a naturalist approach, which is we humans are only part of nature, and uh, we have this fundamental question, is there a God, is there an afterlife? Well, those are issues that are very interesting, and I want to come back to them uh, another time, uh, especially the issue of afterlife. But um, for now, she says, we are creatures of matter who long to matter. And she doesn't mean competitive matter, because... She doesn't mean that um, the pro football player is better than the high school football player or uh, that the president of the United States is any better than any other citizen of the United States. Um, so <clears throat> then they had um, a, he's listed as a philosopher. I don't really know him. It turns out he's more like a theologian. And his answer is simply, God is good, read the New Testament. All rational arguments are in favor of purpose, value, and significance. Okay, well, that's really great. And so, um, at the end of this convocation, the moderator uh, asked this question. What would you tell young people to encourage them? Okay, so Dr. Peterson came up with the Eeyore approach, it, it seems to me, and that was pretty sad. Uh, he says, being is suffering, um, being is suffering tainted by malevolence. So what is the meaning? There is pain to alleviate, there is chaos to confront, there is order to establish and revivify, and there is evil to constrain, not least in our own hearts. And that's meaning enough for everyone. Now, Dr. Peterson, as many of you may know, um, did early research on how tyrannies begin, tyrannies like Nazi Germany and um, Stalin's Russia, the USSR later on. Um, and so he, in very many of his videos, he has a rather dour <laughs> approach to psychology. Um, and then uh, there's Dr. Goldstein, whose basic answer is, what are we supposed to do? We are creatures trying to get our bearings. What is? What matters? We're all in this together. Get into life. Okay great, but that's not a meaning of life. That's advice for a child, I guess. And then um, there's Dr. Craig's answer, which I call the holy roller approach. There may be a transcendent God. There's forgiveness and cleansing available. Pick up a New Testament. Could this really be true? It might change your life as it did mine, as he is the way he put it. Uh, but by that time, they had all morphed into a conversation on morality and religion and not on the meaning of life. So anyway, after being presented with, um, with Dr. Peterson's little poem there uh, about everything is suffering, um, because I live with a Buddhist guru, uh, my wife, Debbie, um, I wanted to give her a chance to respond to Dr. Peterson's poem. And um, let's see, uh, the, the thing that you need to understand about 
um, Debbie's approach is that she is a Buddhist guru and uh, so if you have a hammer the answer to every problem is a nail and so uh, when I read this poem to her uh, her response was well oh my god he he only paid attention to the first of the Four Noble Truths uh, okay so this is the Four Noble Truths are a Buddhist concept um, that the reality uh, the reality of suffering so Dr. Peterson pretty well covered the reality of suffering uh, but he didn't cover the source of the suffering which from a Buddhist perspective is self-grasping and being focused on a small constrained ego that that's the source of the suffering and the next noble truth is you can escape the suffering and then the fourth is the path to escape and the path to escape is the noble eightfold path in Buddhism uh, the noble eightfold path is right view right intention right speech right action or conduct right livelihood right effort right mindfulness right concentration and then uh, there's this special one from Joseph Campbell now uh, throughout the late 1980s and early 1990s I considered Joseph Campbell my guru and I listened to a lot of tapes of him speaking and uh, I thought uh, very highly of him um, and then one day I was driving in my car in eastern North Carolina I remember it very clearly and um, he was responding to a question and answer period and uh, some young woman gets up at the session that he was at this was an audio tape because it was after he had died um, but a young woman had got up, gotten up and said uh, well uh, Dr. Campbell what is the meaning of life and his response was very derisive and he said oh there's no meaning to life there's only an experience of life uh, okay <laughs> I don't know there was something away about his attitude and about the way he said it that just turned me off completely and that's what really made me start to focus on my study of Dr. C.G. Young uh, and so then there's a, another answer which comes from Hindu from the Sanskrit which is uh, Sat Chit Ananda and uh, a Hindu will tell you that that is God it's Brahman it's absolute re reality and the three words um, their fundamental meaning is um, being awareness and bliss in other words um, you know that you're alive um, you're aware that you're alive or you are alive you're aware that you're alive and oh by the way being alive is bliss well I have a fairly big problem with that idea and that is this when you're up to your ass and alligators it's hard to remember your original intent was to drain the swamp um, and so me the meaning of life has to include the dark side as well and uh, as far as I can see uh, it was mostly Dr. Jung that explored that area and um, so now I'll uh, I'll shut up for a couple of moments and see if there are any comments or questions before I go on to uh, Dr. Jung's formulation of this. Any any thoughts, Miles or Jerome or anyone else that's listening on any of the uh, approaches to the meaning of life that you may have heard here? 
Okay, seeing none, um, I will go on. Now, as I mentioned, when I threw my hat over the wall and said, okay, I'm going to talk about the meaning of life for a bit, um, I was only remembering Dr. Jung's first quote uh, from, uh, from what I had shown you before, which is that we can't, we can't stand to be without meaning. And um, Okay, Miles says I have to give you time because um, I've not, I, there's a delay in the broadcast and I, yeah, I do know that I'm learning that as I'm doing these things, um, but feel free to put some thoughts up. And so, anyway, I was um, thinking about this issue, but I hadn't really found the central tenet of Dr. Jung's work. Um, and so I was reading um, from the last um, essay in this book, um, Jung's Red Book for Our Time. And the last essay in the book is by a man named John Woodcock. And, you know, it just so happened that he had a, a footnote in his uh, essay, um, which referred me to the Red Book. And when I went back to the Red Book to see what his footnote um, was referring to, I stumbled upon uh, Dr. Jung's supreme meaning. And so um, once I realized how powerful this is, I really thought that had to be the central uh, thing to talk about in, in this talk. Um, let's see. Miles says, uh, Dr. Lane says, pick up the New Testament but he did not warn that there are many, many faulty or purposely fraudulent translations and likewise fraudulent pastors, parsons, ministers, and priests. Well, that's certainly true. And um, uh, he also argued in a very rational way. And I think that their approach um, it was a somewhat academic approach, uh, but you know they're giving all the all the detailed rational arguments for this or that but they haven't really gotten to uh, the essence of the meaning of life in that um, video and so uh, that's why I'm gonna proceed and um, you know you can take it for what it's worth it's a somewhat long passage uh, but it will help you also understand um, some of the essence of what Dr. Jung was driving out throughout his entire career and uh, it uh, started in 1913 and um, and so what I'm going to read to you is actually at the very beginning of the Red Book. And this is the Red Book Reader's Edition. I'm not going to pull out my folio edition because it's way too big and heavy. I can't even show it on the screen. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I am going to read this to you because uh, it is actually the very beginning of the Red Book. And... Uh, what Dr. Jung was um, uh, being very careful about what he was saying and so careful that he uh, wrote it in German calligraphy himself. And I guess I'd better stop for a minute and pull out the real red book. Okay. Because if you're not familiar with it, um, you need to have a sense of what I'm talking about. So there, there are approximately 200 pages of the Red Book, and these are huge pages, that Dr. Jung himself wrote in um, German calligraphy. 
And so here, here is his work. Wait a minute, I gotta figure out how to get this in the picture. Okay, so here's his work, and it, it's in German calligraphy in his own hand. And so he did all this in his own hand. He, he painted all the pictures and so on. And this is <laughs> the Red Book. You can see how, how huge it is. And uh, this was published in 2009, uh, 48 years after Dr. Young's death. And so most people had no idea uh, what, what was there and what he had done. Okay, uh, let, let's see. Dan says, um, my mom's ex-husband falls under that category. <laughs> wow, wonderful pastor at church and angry six-year-old at home. Okay, <laughs> uh, I won't comment on that, Dan. Uh, also, the first pages of Memories, Dreams, Reflection, C.G. Young, already as a boy, uh, saw grace, whereas even his parson father was missing this meaning of life. Yes, uh, definitely true. We'll, uh, uh, for purposes of this discussion, we'll uh, leave out how he found grace, but uh, certainly uh, he, he was experiencing it through his lifetime. And uh, ironically, um, his five-year-old uh, dream I had a similar dream, but but the opposite dream. So I don't know what that means. But anyway, um, and Kieran, I'm going to have to compile a list of questions for you ahead of time so I can participate in these live chats. That's very wise. Red Book is beautiful. Been wanting to shell out the money for it. Uh, well, okay, in fairness, let's say this. Here's the reader's edition. It doesn't have any of the plates in it. Um, so that is a shortcoming of it, but uh, the good news about it is it's $150 cheaper than the folio edition. And uh, essentially all of the plates which appear in the Red Book you can find online uh, simply by doing a search on C.G. Young Red Book images or something like that, and you can see all the all the pictures that are in the red book. So um, if I do think it's valuable to have uh, the real red book in your collection, uh, but it's about $175. And so if you don't have that money, um, I urge you to get a copy of the reader's edition as a start. Um, Jerome said, for him and anima mundi or the soul of the world, is thereby experienced through those objects that evoke in us a bodily shudder, arousing within us feelings of pleasure or displeasure. Um, yeah, I'll just say yes to that, Jerome. It's not the topic I want to discuss today, so I'm going to leave that and the discussion of anima and anima mundi. Uh, for another uh, time, but what you're saying is definitely true. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, Jerome, I did have an email exchange with John Woodcock, and he sent his greetings to you. So hello from John Woodcock from Australia. I had an interchange with him on Monday. Um, how do people know? Ab how do people know about the Red Book before it was finally released? Uh, the answer to that question is uh, essentially no one knew about it. Only a very few uh, very close disciples of Dr. Jung uh, knew about it. And I think that it's fair to say that even a lot of uh, Jungian analysts were not very conscious of it. Or if they were conscious of it at all, they were, um, if they were conscious that it existed and was in Dr. Young's study through most of his years in practice, over 40 years, um, they had no concept of its contents, really. And they had no con concept of how significant it was to everything else he wrote later. And certainly, 
I never had any such concept. I mean, when I, w when I was drawn into Jungian studies and started my reading for many years, I never had any clue that there was even such a thing as the Red Book. And um, I think that's true of most laymen. I, I, there are very few laymen that would have any idea. And, um, but when I got it, I, and started to read it, I said, oh my God, this is what happened to me uh, when I wrote my novel. And uh, I had had this encounter with the greater personality uh, and I didn't have the words for describing it at that time. And that was 16 years before the Red Book was even published. But when I got my copy of the Red Book and started to read it, I said, oh my God, this is exactly what happened to Dr. Jung. And, and uh, I had been taken over in a very similar way. Um, and so, um, so the answer to your question, Karenu, is um, most people had no clue about the Red Book before it was published. And, um, uh, you know, still it's a very limited group. Uh, okay, anything else before I go on with Dr. Jung's definition of the meaning of life? You'll be very surprised at what it, what it is. But, um, okay, Jerome says, Hillman was addressing awe or experiencing the aesthetic in meaning. The aesthetic is meaning in life. Um, okay, uh, you know, he may, he may have done. Certainly... Um, Hillman was a, an important and profound uh, Jungian scholar of the late 20th century and early 21st century. Uh, and he and the main editor of the Red Book, Sonu Shamdasani, did a lecture tour, uh, which ultimately ended up a, as a book called Lamentations for the Dead. Uh, and uh, it's also a worthwhile book to read. And so uh, Hillman had serious credentials. He, there's a, a very, very powerful video. It's actually audio. There's no video, but uh, of James Hillman doing a defense of Carl Jung uh, in 2005. It's a seven hour long video. Uh, but it's really worth listening to you, too, if you have time. Um, and Miles is drawn to uh, C.G. Young's uh, first pages in Memories, Dreams, Reflections because, from the 1880s because it reminds him of his experience as a boy uh, in the 1960s in Edmonton. And certainly I, I find parallels to myself. Um, I, wrote, I grew up in the Navy, so I lived all over the country, especially before my 12th grade year. And um, uh, some of those early encounters that Dr. Jung had remind me of uh, a time when I was in uh, Kodiak, Alaska, um, in the early 1950s, and also um, my time in a, a, boor, a roaring metropolis of Paw Paw, Michigan, which is a suburb of Kalamazoo, Michigan. At, at the time that I lived there, uh, it was a real um, little town out in the middle of nowhere. Now it turns out it's like the next exit from Kalamazoo on Interstate 94. So it has got a little more attention. But in those days, there was no such interstate highway. And so it was just a little town out in the middle of Michigan. Um, right. And Miles says, especially the wonder of nature, nature trees, leaves, and sunlight. Um, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, I'm sure miles uh, given where you live that um, you know whenever it snows you can look out and see uh, a special quiet on uh, the evergreens maybe outside of your home and whenever I see that um, uh, 
does make me emotional because it reminds me of a place that I lived in Kodiak um, where we were actually living in a skid shack, <laughs> a three-room skid shack. This is a house on skids that could be pulled around, uh, but outside that house was a little lake and uh, evergreen trees and obviously there was a fair amount of snow up there and so uh, it reminds me of those days. Uh, Bill is here. Campbell's okay. The meaning of life question is conceptual. The meaning of life is revealed in the living of life. Even to frame the question is to miss the meaning. The question chases its own tail. Uh, so um, Bill, I, I, I want to uh, bring your attention now to what I'm going to read from uh, Dr. Jung. It, it basically agrees with what you're saying, uh, but I, uh, I think you'll be surprised at how, um, uh, how much of a summary it truly is. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, let me uh, begin to give you uh, Dr. Young's meaning of life here. Okay, so this um, is in the very first section of um, the Red Book. And Dr. Young says, The spirit of the depths took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplicable and the paradoxical. Now, in later years, that inexplicable and paradoxical became the self in Jungian psychology and um, the God image. Um, but anyway, he, he goes on to define the supreme meaning. But the supreme meaning is the path, the way, and the bridge to what is to come. That is the God yet to come. It is not the coming God himself, but his image which appears in the supreme meaning. God is an image, and those who worship him must worship him in the image of the supreme meaning. The supreme meaning is not a meaning and not an absurdity. It is an image and force in one, magnificence and force together. The supreme meaning is the beginning and the end. It is the bridge of going across and fulfillment. The other gods died of their temporality, temporality yet the supreme meaning never dies. It turns into meaning and then into absurdity, and out of the fire and blood of their collision, the supreme meaning rises up, rejuvenated anew. The image of God has a shadow. The supreme meaning is real and casts a shadow. For what can be actual and corporeal and have no shadow? The shadow is nonsense. It lacks force and has no continued existence through itself. But nonsense is the inseparable and undying brother of the supreme meaning. Like plants, so men also grow, some in the light, others in the shadows. There are many who need the shadows and not the light. The image of God throws a shadow that is just as great as itself. The supreme meaning is great and small, and it is as wide as the space of the starry heaven and as narrow as the cell of the living body. Now, what is to be remembered here is that uh, this is Dr. Jung's unconscious basically telling him this. Um, and so then he reacts to this he's and so he's in his active imagination and we have to understand that he did not mean this active imagination was generic or what was happening was generic it was what was happening to him and so he says the spirit of this time in me wanted to recognize the greatest and extent of the supreme meaning but not its littleness the spirit of the depths, however, 
conquered this arrogance, and I had to swallow the small as a means of healing the immortal in me. It completely burned up my innards since it was inglorious and unheroic. It was even ridiculous and revolting, but the pliers of the spirit of the depths held me, and I had to drink the bitterest of, dra of all drafts. The spirit of this time tempted me with the thought that all this belongs to the shadowiness of the God image. This would be, per this would be pernicious deception, since the shadow is nonsense, but the small, narrow, and banal is not nonsense, but one of both of the essences of the Godhead. I resisted recognizing that the everyday belongs to the image of the Godhead. I fled this thought. I hid myself behind the highest and coldest stars. But the spirit of the depths caught me, caught up with me, and forced the bitter drink between my lips. The spirit of this time whispered to me, This supreme meaning, this image of God, this melting together of the hot, and the cold, that is you, and only you. If, you. if you did not possess all of this, how could you know? Okay, now this is Dr. Young's unconscious referring to him, um, but we'll see how he reacts to this in a moment. He's not trying to set himself up as a savior by any means. He says, um, But the spirit of the depths stepped up to me and said, What you speak is, the greatness is, the intoxication is, the undignified, sick, paltry, dailiness is. It runs in all the streets, lives in all the houses, and rules the day of all humanity. Even the eternal stars are commonplace. It is the great mystery and the one essence of God. One laughs about it, and laughter, too, is. Do you believe, man of this time, that laughter is lower than worship? Where is your measure, false measurer? The sum of life decides in laughter and in worship, not your judgment. The mercy which happened to me gave me belief, hope, and sufficient daring not to resist further the spirit of the depths, but to utter his word. But before I could pull myself together to really do it, I needed a visible sign that would show me that the spirit of the depths in me was at the same time the ruler of the depths of world affairs. It happened in October of the year 1913. The date was October 17th, 1913. As I was leaving alone for a journey that during the day I was suddenly overcome in broad daylight by a vision. I saw a terrible flood that covered all the northern and low-lying lands between the North Sea and the Alps. It reached from England up to Russia, and from the North Sea right up to the Alps. I saw yellow waves, swimming rubble, and the death of countless thousands. This vision lasted for two hours. It confused me and made me ill. I was not able to interpret it. Two weeks passed, then the vision returned, still more violent than before, and an inner voice spoke. Look at it. It is completely real, and it will come to pass. You cannot doubt it. It left me exhausted and confused, and I thought my mind had gone crazy. So Dr. Young had three more dreams, two in June and one at the beginning of July, 1914. Uh, the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated on June 28, 1914. World War I commenced on July 28, 1914. Dr. Jung found himself in Scotland giving a lecture when World War I broke out. He immediately returned home and commented 
uh, that he was very happy that day because he knew he was not going crazy. In fact, he had discovered the collective unconscious. So then he goes on and uh, to show that he's not trying to set himself up as a messiah, he says, believe me, it is no teaching and no instruction that I give you. On what basis should I presume to teach you? I give you news of the way of this man, but not of your own way. My path is not your path, therefore I cannot teach you. The way is within us, not in gods, nor in teachings, nor in laws. Within us is the way, the truth, and the life. Woe betide those who live by way of examples. Life is not with them. If you live according to an example, you thus live the life of that example. But who should live your life if not yourself? So live yourselves. The signposts have fallen. Unblazed trails lie before us. Do not be greedy to gobble up the fruits of foreign fields. Do you not know that you yourselves are the fertile acre, which bears everything that avails you? You who today, yet who today knows this? Who knows the way to the eternally fruitful climes of the soul? You seek the way through mere appearances. You study books and give ear to all kinds of opinion. But what good is all that? There is only one way, and that is your way. You seek the path? I warn you away from my own. I can, al I can also be wrong it can also be the wrong way for you. May each go his own way. I will be no savior, no lawgiver, no master teacher unto you. You are no longer little children. Therefore give people dignity and let each of them stand apart so that each may find his own fellowship and love it. Power stands against power, contempt against contempt, love against love. Give human dignity and trust that life will find the better way. Now there's this footnote. Um, the draft continues. One should not turn people into sheep, but sheep into people. The spirit of the depth demands this, who is beyond present and past. Speak and write for those who want to listen and read. But do not run after men, so that you do not soil the dignity of humanity. It is a rare good. A sad demise in dignity is better than an undignified healing. Whoever wants to be a doctor of the soul sees people as being sick. He offends human dignity. It is presumptuous to say that man is sick. Whoever wants to be the soul shepherd treats people like sheep. Who gives you the right to say that man is sick and a sheep? Give him human dignity so that, you, that he may find his ascendancy or downfall his way. So what is the meaning of life according to Dr. C.G. Jung? Just think about that for a moment. What has he said here? It's a very complex and profound thought that he's provided. Okay, the way I read it is the meaning of life is you. Okay, not me, not Dr. Jung, but you. And what he means by that is, in my opinion, um, Let, let's go a little further. He says, You are the sum of all that has come before and the bridge to what is to come. Um, and so what he's saying is that 
each of us is the sum total of everything that's gone before, um, all the way back to even before uh, the beginning of the earth. So the meaning of life is in every human being, and, and it's in every living thing, in fact. And, um, and so um, everything that we see in our environment that's alive um, is the meaning of life, and it's the sum total of everything that has come before um, uh, that way. So this reminded me of a little bit of dialogue um, from Cosmos by Carl Sagan. A colleague says, so what will you use your precious telescope time for, Ellie? And Dr. Ellie Arroway responds, little green men. And so that was her answer. Okay, now let's have a little conversation. I see things have become uh, interesting over here. Okay, so Miles says, wow, the supreme meaning is beautiful. I need to get those words written down. Uh, and so, uh, Miles, these will be available to you um, on this video. And... Um, I will also uh, put them in the Dropbox uh, for today's date, uh, 02.07.18, um, so that you can uh, uh, just download uh, my, uh, the things that I've included on this video. Um, and if you're not a member of our Dropbox, please send me your email address to skip.conover at gmail.com and I will add you to the Dropbox. Um, so Miles goes on to say, the supreme meaning, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of the buffalo in the wintertime. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. Um, word of Chief Crowfoot of the Blackfoot Confederacy in 1877, spirit of this time wants to crush these words um yeah absolutely the spirit of this time is um is the ego and dr jung was talking about the spirit of his time um rebelling within him as he was receiving these words from his self and uh and he fought back and forth about it, but uh, he worked on this Red Book for 16 years. And so obviously uh, these words, which he hand wrote personally in German calligraphy at the very beginning of the Red Book, obviously he felt that they were extremely important. Um, so Dan Bale says, uh, so he says this vision showed him how the spirit of the depths in himself was the same as the spirit of the depths in world affairs. I don't see how he made that connection. Okay, well, um, what he's saying, and it's not necessarily in this passage, but what he and Dr. Freud were always saying is that dreams and visions are messages from the un unconscious. And um, at that time, which was over a hundred years ago now, uh, they were mainly uh, referring to the personal unconscious. And so when Dr. Jung started to receive these visions that were prefigurations of World War I, um, he thought he was going crazy. He had been around uh, many hundreds of patients in the Bergoldsley uh, Mental Hospital in Zurich uh, for a decade or so, and he knew that people had these visions. and he had his visions and so he therefore 
uh, thought that, you know, maybe something was going wrong in, in his own psyche. And so, and these visions came to him stronger and stronger throughout this nine month period from October 17th, 1913 up until uh, July of uh, 2014. And so when World War I commenced, he was happy because he realized that he wasn't going crazy and he realized something else was afoot. And so it was kind of in this time period, uh, and especially in that aha moment at the outbreak of World War I, that he realized that something else was going on. It was more than just the personal unconscious that was at work. And um, he was once asked what uh, his most important finding was, and he said, oh, that's the collective unconscious. And so this collective unconscious goes very deep. It not only includes family and nation and so on, but it involves all humanity. Um, and, you know, the details of that are a bit beyond the scope of this discussion. We can talk about it in, uh, in the future. But... Um, in terms of the meaning of life, um, you know, what he's saying is that there is something that's stronger than our ego, that knows better than we know. And it's in the unconscious, it's in our, our unconscious, but it's also in the collective unconscious. So if you have dreams of, and visions, um, you should pay attention to them. Um, obviously, when I had uh, visions that were on the same order of magnitude in 1993, uh, I did pay attention to them, but I thought I was just having a writer's creativity moment, and uh, you know, it was just flowing out of my unconscious, and I was just taking notes. I wasn't thinking anything up. Uh, and, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, it was uh, a very powerful experience like this experience that Dr. Jung had. Okay, so, um, Miles says, I've wondered about visions out of the blue. I remember my brother telling me he wasn't going to have a long life. Indeed, he died at 36. In a small plane crash. I'm very sorry to hear that, Miles. I I lost my brother at age 39, and uh, he died from something equally um, unexpected, which was that he drank Mountain Spring water in Vail, Colorado, and got a an amoebic infection, which ultimately ate his liver, uh, and. Um, so anyway, that's a long story, but in any case, uh, we have something in common there. And uh, I, I don't recall my brother ever telling me any visions though. Um, so Dan says, and then the question arises, what were the intentions of the unconscious when sending this premonition? Um, well, that's, uh, I. That's a fair question. I think it might have been a warning. Um, and uh, if you go back to the Bible, you'll find that many of the teachings of the Bi Bible come out of either dreams or visions. And uh, so people are reporting dreams or visions, and God came to them in uh, dreams, or, uh, you know, both Mary and Joseph reported. Uh, the dream of the angel coming and impregnating Mary and so um, that was a dream that might have saved her life because she had it and Joseph too had it as a result she didn't get stoned to death and, and instead became the mother of God 
Um, and so, <laughs> what can I say? But, I mean, you go back to Abraham and, and Isaac and the story of Isaac's sacrifice, and obviously um, Abraham had a, um, had a vision that told him to stop this human sacrifice baloney. Um, and that had been a scourge of the ancient world human sacrifice and uh, it's still a scourge of our world we've we've nicened it up so that we say that we're sacrificing our sons for a war or for national defense or something like that but nonetheless we do sacrifice um, our best and our brightest sometimes um, and so the point is that um, for Dr. Jung, as a psychiatrist, I think that this vision was telling him that there is something more than what he knew up until that time. He was, he was still uh, only 38 years old when this started to happen, and he was starting his midlife crisis. He was in a very emotional state because he'd broken up with Sigmund Freud, who'd been like a father figure to him. And so in that emotional state, uh, the psyche comes through and it tells you something. And um, uh, here what he says is that um, we should rely on nature. Uh, and the psyche is nature. And so going back to Rebecca Goldstein's um, comment, yeah, okay, um, it is nature, and the psyche is nature, and the psyche is real. Nobody can deny that, even though they don't want to give credence to it, but the fact is that the psyche is real, and if, uh, if it's not real for you, then you're having no dreams, um, your heart isn't beating 72 times a minute, your lungs aren't breathing 12 times a minute, because your psyche does all those things for you and your body isn't re reproducing every cell in your body every seven years all those ha things happen uh, in our unconscious and they happen perfectly so why should anyone assume that dreams and visions are not a serious part of our evolutionary being um, and um, just because they're giving you images that, that uh, are different doesn't mean that they aren't true, okay? Because this is coming, as Dr. Jung referred to it, this is coming from the two million year old man. It's coming from your evolutionary ancestors. Your psyche is from that. And... Uh, it's not evolving any further after the day of your birth. Uh, and so it has to use what images, um, it doesn't have language per se, it has images. That's how it gave warnings. And, um, you know, I've often told this story about how I don't need a radar detector because every time I drive near a speed trap, I get a vision, a vision of a police car driving from right to left across in front of me. And that vision, it's always the same, but my psyche says uh, police, basically. It warns me and says police. And I slow down, and sure enough, within two minutes, I will see a police car doing something. Um, and it's because my unconscious uh, registers things that my conscious mind doesn't and so when it registers those things which suggests that you know there's police enforcement around boom up in front of my eyes comes this police car and and that's the, the message from my two million year old man that there is danger I mean maybe it's interpreting those changes which that it's perceiving as danger, 
And, you know, what are those things? Well, maybe ongoing traffic is um, changing its speed. Now, oncoming traffic uh, is changing its speed, or uh, it notices brake lights way up ahead of, uh, of me, and so my conscious mind may be focused on the next car, or the th next three cars in front of me, but unconsciously I might be registering uh, a car that's uh, a mile ahead of me, and seeing a brake light there, but I'm not consciously registering it, but my unconscious is, and it's my unconscious is recognizing that as danger. And so, um, therefore, it gives me this vision. That's the way it works for me, one of the ways, anyway. Um, so, uh, Let's see, Dan says, if it was a warning, I think it would have been more specific. I think it makes more sense. It was just trying to make its presence known and studied and mingled with. Um, yeah, I think that that's basically what was happening and that Dr. Jung recognized that. I mean, obviously, he was an accomplished psychiatrist by the time this Red Book period began. And so his psyche was telling him something different maybe from what your psyche would tell you based on your experience. But nonetheless, uh, it was trying to give, you, give him a message. And uh, the message was, hey, I'm here. There's something here. Pay attention. And, um, and it certainly caused him to pay attention. I mean, he... Uh, later said that this was basically the prima materia of all of his other work, 20 volumes of work. Uh, but no one, very few people even knew that before 2009. Um, so, uh, Miles says, memories, dreams, and reflections have a premonition aspect to them. Certainly, it, that's true. Um, and there's certainly some comments about um, biblical studies and about Christianity per se there that are worth paying attention to. Uh, I to Miles says, I totally agreed to be skeptical about what anyone else says. Uh, we must not ever check out, check our brain at the door. Well, absolutely. And this was his message. And um, interestingly, um, in, in this brief passage that I read to, to you, it talked about uh, not treating people like sheep. And uh, there's this interesting scene between uh, Dr. Jung and Otto Gross in the movie A Dangerous Method, where uh, Otto Gross is schooling Dr. Jung on um, the fact that they're only freeing people to be themselves. They're not uh, trying to drive people in a certain way. And, uh, you know, whether that actually happened in true life, I don't know, but certainly the, the movie maker had gotten the, gotten the message. And I believe that that movie came out before the Red Book, so um, whoever the producer was was very smart. Um, so Miles says, on some occasions I have felt a radar ahead. Perhaps we are con unconsciously sensitive to the radar waves. Uh, well, certainly that may well be true, uh, Miles. In fact, I've wondered whether uh, we're also uh, unconsciously aware of um, transmission waves coming out of cell phones and things like that. Um, certainly in my life, at least for the last um, uh, 45 years, I've had a very serious case of tinnitus. Um, and uh, doctors to this day don't know where, what it is, but uh, basically it sounds like a fax tone, um, and 
in me, I can differentiate at least 12 different frequencies of tone in my ears. If I focus on it and meditate on it, I can count 12 different frequencies. And, um, you know, I've often wondered whether that means I'm somehow picking up uh, waves, you know, radio waves or telephone waves out there in the universe. Um, Miles says, uh, my mother once was awakened and told my dad, Aunt Peg, had died. Aunt Peg had died. Uh, sure enough, that morning, Sheriff in Boise, Idaho, called to tell them the sad news. I have no reason to think my mom and dad invented it. Um, there, you know, are many stories throughout Dr. Young's work of events that happened um, that he was conscious of but had no good reason to be conscious. I, I think in memories he recounts a story of how a, a nephew uh, had fallen in the water in his boathouse uh, one day, and uh, he had envisioned that, and he was far away. Um, and so one of the critical videos of Dr. Jung uh, which you can find on YouTube, um, is the YouTube uh, video in which he says, uh, you know, the world hangs by a thin thread, and that is the psyche of man. Um, but he goes on in that video to say, we know nothing. We, we know no thing, is the way he put it. Not, he, didn't use, he didn't say the word as nothing. He said it as, we know no thing about the psyche. And he included with that himself. And so uh, that's certainly an area for research for the future. I know some people are doing it. Um, and it, we need a lot more of it because um, there's very evidently and palpably uh, things going on that we can't explain but are actually physically happening uh, in some sense. And just because you can't touch it, measure it, figure out its length, depth, and width, um, and slice and dice it, just because you can't physically do that, it doesn't mean it's not real. And so that's one of the big issues. Um, Julie Westmacott says, I think Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning is a great help in understanding the collective unconscious, especially the symbolic aspect of dreams, I presume is what you're saying. And um, I have no doubt about that. I, I've not read all of Maps of Meaning, but uh, I've read parts of it, and it's obviously very powerful. And um, I don't mean to... Um, speak ill of Dr. Peterson. I think he is a tremendous intellect, and I personally have learned a lot from him. Um, and uh, But uh, lately he seemed a little off, actually. He seems to be losing weight. His health isn't uh, cooperating with him. And just in this particular event, the Wycliffe College, Wycliffe Wycliffe College event that occurred a couple of weeks back, um, he seemed off and, um, and very dark in, what, in the way he was talking about things. And, um, you know, if, Jordan, if you're watching this, I urge you to um, meditate on that because obviously there's... Uh, two sides to the picture, and, um, and this was a very dark uh, Jordan Peterson that we saw in that video. Um, so anyway, um, this is more or less the time that I've allocated for this, but if I'll certainly answer any more questions that you may have. Uh, while I wait to watch, uh, while I watch the live chat, because I understand there is a delay that's going out, 
Um, I'm going to put up again the con Dr. Jung's uh, famous quote about the meaning about meaning and the need for meaning, and then if I if I don't see anyone asking more questions, I may uh, terminate the broadcast at some point. Uh, Karen says Jordan was just talking about his health last week on Joe Rogan says he was battling with his health last year but doing great now um, he's been through a very traumatic time there's no doubt about that because uh, I'm sure that he's been um, put up against the very foundations of his psyche when you know his tenured professorship at the University of Toronto has been threatened and so on and um, and so uh, I I don't think um, it's unexpected to see him having that kind of an experience um, and I mean the kind of experience that would be traumatic and therefore make him um, feel badly but I mean uh, looking at his performance on um, Patreon um, I think that the following that he's developed uh, certainly has helped him because you know a year and a half ago he was looking at sort of his career coming to a, a crashing end and he was he was sticking to his guns, but he was very worried. I think now that he has such a strong following, uh, I think he's much more confident uh, about his life. Um, I do think. Okay, so Kiranu says I do think Jordan has been traveling way too much to promote his book. He admits. He has lost sleep. I don't think he's accepted. It's overburdening him. Um, and I certainly um, am, you know, even my following here has told me to slow down um, because last week, the beginning of last week, I had this crazy idea that I could go online every day for an hour. And uh, that's I, found, I did it for two days and I found out it's just not possible because in order to do a good job on these Q&A sessions, uh, I really need to spend some preparation time and that takes more than a day. I have, I have nobody helping me. Um, and Julie Westmacott says, I have kept note of my dreams for many years. I have lots of examples where my dreams foretold reality. I think most people find this out if they keep note of them. I certainly agree with that, Julie. And um, uh, I know um, my friend uh, Jean Rafa uh, has been keeping dream books for at least 40 years and you know, has reams of them and she discusses them um, uh, in great detail uh, in connection with her archetypal work. Uh, which can be found on uh, jeanrafa.wordpress.com. She's she's written an excellent uh, three excellent books, but the most recent one is called Healing the Sacred Divide, and it's uh, worth your time. Let me I'll just type uh, the name of her book in here. Yeah, this is that's an excellent book, and I recommend it. Um, so Miles says uh, Jordan Peterson has been a good teacher, and we can learn even more from him from what he doesn't say. He chooses world words carefully; and must listen carefully. Um, yes, indeed. I mean. Um, that's true of all of us, uh, obviously, it includes me, but um, Jerome says Peterson broke down and cried when he asked about, when asked about college students, snowflakes, quote unquote, that needed to grow up. Um, okay, I, you know, I don't think that 
any of us, everything that we say is golden wisdom and, and someone we may um, use inappropriate language from time to time. Um, I, I think there's a, a point that we have to make that um, someone asked me online uh, on one of the videos whether I thought that um, the idea of individuation per se should be taught in schools. And I don't think that that's the case. And I think that um, Dr. Jung would be very critical of that idea because um, the first part of life, um, the time of life when you're a student and so on, is really learning how to be a mature human being. And that period really carries on into your 40s sometimes um, because uh, you're learning first your uh, physical imperative of uh, uh, reproduction and the necessities around reproduction, the responsibilities of being a, a father or a mother and bringing your children up to the point where they can cope on their own. But just because you've gotten to be 20 or 21 and graduated from college doesn't know you really know much. And that's why so many people have a breakdown in their uh, late 30s and 40s. And that breakdown often leads to this individuation process and uh, realizing the opposites. And so uh, when that happens, you have to have developed your ego uh, so that you can cope with it. If you haven't done that, uh, then you're going to be in serious trouble. Um, and so um, from a Jungian perspective, the way to develop the ego is to um, go through the Joe Barca type cycle many times. Con uh, conflict, defeat, lamentation, and rebirth. Um, and so the, my simple example of that is the, is the voice uh, reality program where everybody thinks that they can be a uh, rock singer, but most of us can't. And so the great thing about the voice is it lets so many young people go in and contest that. And, of course, most are defeated, and obviously they would lament about their defeat, but then they can go on to uh, become what they should become. And uh, that's the essence of the individuation process, which we're all in throughout our lifetime one way or another. Um, so Julie says, great job you are doing, fascinating and appreciated. Well, thank you, Julie. I really, I certainly appreciate a comment like that. It's, it makes it uh, helpful for me to make it seem worthwhile to me uh, to do it. Um, let's see. Uh, Karen, uh, La, yes, you, up, you uploaded too many videos. Yes, I probably uploaded too many videos, but um, a week from today I'm going to have my ankle replaced, so I'm not going to be available at least for a while, and so I hope that I've left behind enough for everybody to keep uh, studying uh, while I'm un unavailable. Uh, and just, just an update, I listened to your reading of Aeon, Still having a hard time processing anima, self, and shadow. Hopefully, I will understand in time. My mental digestive system is slow. Uh, Dan, all of us are slow. And very honestly, um, I am learning things from books that I've read uh, ten times from Dr. Jung. Uh, and, you know, that's a continuing process. I told my reading group, my, my physical reading group, that, you know, Dr. Jung's, uh, 
process is to circumambulate the center, but you know, we, by going to this reading group, we're going to go very deep. Well, we have gone very deep over the last almost two years now, and uh, I think all of us have learned things that we didn't know before. Uh, I certainly have, and I and. Uh, uh, the members that meet with me every week have helped me enormously to develop depth in my own understanding. And I think that that's a lifetime process. And um, I have, uh, as I have said a few times, I have been studying this material for 30 years, and there's plenty there to study. Um, Let's see, uh, Miles says, thanks, great learning from me. Thank you, sir. Uh, then CJ Law says, gosh, took me a while to work out where to write. It's like we are here to all write our own story, playing many roles. Uh, yes, we have many roles. And, um, you know, if, if you do nothing else, uh, you should uh, write for yourself. And that's what the Red Book represents. That's what Dr. Young was doing, and that was uh, what he recommended for others, to um, write things down that you're learning. It may not be appropriate for public consumption, but uh, he said uh, something to the effect uh, that if you save these things, uh, these will become your church. And, um, and I think there's something to that. Um, Dan Bale says, uh, I had a small notebook about a year ago that I wrote all my dreams, daily thoughts in, lost it in a public place, wondering what thoughts went through the mind of whoever picked it up and read it. Well, maybe no one would have read it, <laughs> Dan. Uh, but if you've had no negative repercussions, I think that's probably a good thing. I, I had, um, I had a lot of a personal notebook and uh, a laptop computer stolen from me in Saudi Arabia once, and um, I worried about the contents of that computer because obviously there were business secrets in it among many other things um, and many of those uh, private and uh, I never heard a thing about it and so we, we can hope that people don't um, pay much attention when they steal something like that or pick up something like that. Uh, CJ Law, to get that frequency and also hear the pitch change skip. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, Julie, I'm sorry I don't understand Julie's comment, uh, haha, dad, that made me. Uh, so, Miles says, uh, Dan, who knows, it might be published someday. Yeah, it might be. And, if it is, then you can try to claim it. <laughs> uh, Lady Shea says, uh, Hi guys, sorry I'm late. Slept off a nasty headache. Did I miss much? Uh, well, yes. <laughs> Actually, you've missed an hour and a half, and I urge you to go back and um, listen to the, the replay once I can get it online. Uh, Julia, oh no, I didn't think you were in... Okay, she was, uh, Julie was commenting on the chat on the collective unconscious. Kieran, I wish you the best in your surgery. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm not concerned. I had uh, my left knee replaced last summer, and I have zero complaints. So we have uh, total control of um, pain and uh, joint replacement in the United States, at least. And uh, I'm very 
confident about what will happen. Uh, I've been struggling with this ankle for 28 years. Uh, since I broke it, it was the last thing I did in uniform in the U.S. Marines as I broke my leg. And um, I, uh, they inserted a prosthesis in my ankle at that time and I've managed with it for all those years, but finally it's time to get it fixed so that I can keep my aerobic health up uh, for my later years. Um, let's see. Uh, so did Jordan Peterson get his self-authoring program idea from C.G. Young, asked Miles. I have no idea. I, I mean, certainly C.G. Young was very instrumental in um, Dr. Peterson's thinking, but you know whether whether uh, that's that was his source. I just don't know. I haven't I haven't studied his self-authoring program, and I, obviously I'm at a different point of life than his students, and so I've pretty much done the authoring of myself <laughs> at this point, except. You know, now I'm authoring it in a different way, but I haven't gone back to look at what he actually said there. Um, and uh, Julie commented on the Jean Rafa book. Yeah, you know, it's she's she's a very smart lady, and she's written some very smart books. Uh, I'll tell you a story about that uh, book. Um, Jean. Is, is not a Jungian analyst, but I had found her um, a decade or so ago uh, when I wanted to do the uh, Archetype in Action website. And I'll just put that uh, name in here so that you can find it. And you'll find many of her articles on um, that website. Um, and that website is basically a representation of my psyche and where I what I was thinking uh, since December of 2010 uh, for what it's worth but um, I had found Jean because she was writing some excellent pieces about archetype and especially the archetypes that happen um, during life the transitional archetypes that we all have to go through and we need to know about and um, so I was interacting with Jean and um, ironically in all that time we've only had uh, one Skype call uh, we've exchanged email messages quite a few times but we've only uh, been face to face <laughs> once uh, but in any case um, Jean made a comment at one point that Jungian analysts aren't, don't pay attention to her. And uh, she's since uh, retracted that a bit, but um, that's what I heard her say. And uh, one morning, or one day, I opened my mailbox and there was a huge package and it was a manuscript of uh, Healing the Sacred Divide and she asked me if I would read it and provide a criti critique of it and so on. Um, so I, I read it in just a couple of days. It was a 450 page manuscript and um, when I got to the end of it it was 4 a.m. and um, I was dazed and literally tears were running down my face as I read the end of her book and um, uh, I had a vision at that time and the vision was as follows um, I realized that I was a dragon a fire breathing dragon and I flew over to Jean's house, which was floating in the sky. And I looked in the window on the front door. And in the front, I saw Jean. And Jean was a dragon, too. And she was facing away from me. But she looks back at me and sees me through the window. And 
she comes out and she jumps out into the sky next to me. And the two of us fly through a very uh, dark and sort of stormy night. And we came to a silo uh, where the golden seeds of wisdom were kept. And we landed on the top of the silo and uh, ripped the roof off. And as we did that, a great wind came up and it blew the golden seeds of wisdom out into um, uh, out into the universe so others could hear it. And really, ever since then, um, that's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to get the, these pieces of wisdom out from under the Jungian analyst uh, group because they have a uh, different uh, rationale for what they're doing than what I'm doing. Um, I've been focused more on the implications for society, whereas Jungian analysts focus on the individual for the most part. And I think that, you know, Dr. Jung said some very dramatic things with respect to religion, and his, especially in his later work, and that has largely been kept under wraps and it was seriously criticized by theologians and psychologists and um, and I never understood why I couldn't find anything on this and it was only when I found Dr. Edward Edinger's work uh, where he explained what Dr. Jung was saying then when I when I found that oh my god then I realized the enormity of what he was saying and the importance of it for uh, Christianity as it's practiced in the West and indeed for all religions. Um, so, uh, let's see. Julie Westmont says, we also have a internal compass. Yeah, uh, we certainly do. Um, and Let's see. Uh, great talk motivates us all to get busy and find our own unique bridge. Uh, Kiranu, vibrant red. Oh, so Kiranu is is uh, communicating with Julie. I'll leave those out of my discussion. <laughs> and Lady Shea, I realize I've arrived late and all. I just had a strange experience today and was wondering if there's time to answer this. If Jung said anything about out-of-body experiences. Um, I'll, I'll, let me think about that online. I think that there certainly, uh, yes, yeah, so certainly there was a, a major out-of-body experience at the time of his um, uh, heart attack in 1944, and it was that experience uh, explicitly uh, which caused him to want to write Ion, uh, and so, and I think that that experience is described in memories, dreams, reflections. It's a very powerful uh, vision, but I'm not. I'm not going to get into it today. Uh, Miles, Dr. Jung was living by the motto: "If you are not making everyone angry, you are not doing your job." Yeah. Um, Definitely so, <laughs> and it goes along with uh, uh, my motto about never trust anyone with a clean desk, <laughs> uh, because uh, people with messy desks are are messing around with people's lives. I'm sure. Uh, Karen, I found an article once about Jung having a near death experience. Not sure. If it was like out of body, yeah, it definitely was. I, uh, Lady Shea has reminded me of that, and I just mentioned it. Um, and it was, uh, it was in 1944 when he had his heart attack. He he lived another 17 years afterward. Thank goodness, because a lot of his most important writing came in that period. And uh, 
But anyway, as I look at the clock, we're now an hour and 40 minutes into this discussion. Um, what I would ask is that if, um, for everyone that's here, if you will um, send me any suggestions for topics within the Jungian work that you'd like me to speak about in future Q&As, I'd be happy to uh, take your advice. I happen to have a little notebook of ideas I've had, but um, I thought the meaning of life would be an <laughs> important enough thing so that everybody would want to pay attention to that topic. Um, but um, if you have ideas, please let me know. Um, my email address is uh, skipconover at gmail.com. Um, there it is. Um, and uh, if you are not a member of our Dropbox, please do that. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, I urge you to do that and also to um, click on the little bell next to the sub subscribe button so that you get notified when we are doing Q&As. Also, if you have any advice on what would be a more convenient time to do it. Um, and uh, Clive, um, can I summarize real quick? I uh, know I can't, uh, Clive. Uh, there's, there's a very comprehensive discussion on the meaning of life in this uh, conversation and it will be online on uh, as a recording uh, shortly after I terminate this uh, conversation and so you can go back and listen to it but um, I, I couldn't possibly summarize it now um, and so Miles is going to write questions. Uh, Dan says, good chat. Karen, I can induce sleep paralysis by falling on my back. It frightens me, so I always sleep on my side. Um, well, I can induce sleep paralysis by <laughs> reading uh, a Jungian book into my, uh, into the video. And uh, I think I, it, what it's doing is it's self-hypnotizing me. And hypnosis, uh, hypnotic, hypnotic induction um, basically confuses the conscious mind so that you can't keep up with everything that's happening. And there's so much happening in uh, Jungian books that even when I read only for 10 minutes, Sometimes I'll go oh, and just fall asleep, and so that makes for some rather funny videos from time to time. Um, I've been meaning to uh, get one up that has a huge yawn from me, uh, but I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, never notice any difference with temperature. Falling asleep on back is a very common symptom. Wonder why that is. No idea. <laughs> That, that's something that you need to talk with a sleep specialist about. Um, Miles says, C.G. Young talks of being a child who was fainting at will and will. Yeah, he does. And uh, he probably self-cured this neurosis. Uh, I think that's true. And obviously, uh, I think we all have neuroses at some point in our life, or maybe all the time. And what I've found is that by reading Dr. Young's work, uh, it has allowed me to self-cure. Uh, except for marriage counseling, when my first marriage broke up, which was only five sessions, I, I've never had psychotherapy per se, and that wasn't really psychotherapy in my view. Um, and, uh, uh, but I do think it, reading Dr. Young's work can help you straighten yourself out. And it certainly has done that for me. Uh, Clive says, how much of Jung would you say is physical or spiritual soul related? 
uh, well, Clivet's also related because uh, uh, a psychiatrist and a psychologist are doctors of the soul. Uh, so, um, in some sense, it's all spiritual. Um, in some sense, I, I mean, in a, in a way, it, I'm sort of bemused by the fact that Dr. Jung was always so careful about uh, mentioning that when he was talking about God, he was talking about the God image, which he empirically found in the deepest levels of the unconscious. So he found that as a part of the psyche, and he said that's not the metaphysical God. And, but then he also said, oh, by the way, we can't tell the difference between a metaphysical God and the God image. And I say as a lawyer, it's a distinction without a difference because everything in uh, psychology is metaphysical. <laughs> it's all in here. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Dan says, I don't know anyone, anybody else who experiences it. Do you ever experience visions while in that state? Uh, I probably do uh, because I, um, I have a very active psyche. Uh, and, you know, I'm... I'm very often in deep thought and so I may in, indeed be dreaming I mean I uh, my wife worries but I've been known to close my eyes during a stop at a red light and have three different dreams in that period of time which is maybe five seconds or ten seconds and um, I'm quite the phenom at my weekly meditation group. I go to a Buddhist meditation group that has uh, five practicing psychotherapists as members of the group. And uh, when we do our meditation in that group, um, in Buddhist, in Tibetan Buddhist meditation, you're supposed to keep your eyes open. And I never can. And I very often fall asleep and it's usually the best sleep that I get during the week and I very often have two or three dreams during that period. Um, uh, Clive, is, is there a way to bridge the soul and the body physical world? Is it a matter of grounding one in the other? Um, well, Clive, you are the bridge, um, and um, and so I think you might want to think about that observation, um, because um, uh, you know that's basically what Doctor Jung was saying in terms of the supreme meaning. Uh, which is that we are the bridge the, of the path going forward in the future. And each of us is the meaning of life. Um, yeah, each of us is the meaning of life at this point in time. And so, you know, I don't know where we're going, but we're going. Uh, I guess that's the, the phrase that I want. Um, okay, Julie S. says that she'd love to have me uh, talk about Mar Marie Louise von Franz's fairy tales. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, the one book that of hers that I've read cover to cover is uh, The Grail Legend, which she wrote with Emma Young. And um, I do have 
her book Interpretation of Fairy Tales, which I haven't yet read, uh, and I um, hope to have time. Probably I'll have some time during my uh, convalescence starting next week. Um, how would I car characterize, Clive asks, how would you characterize choice or free will? Um, I guess it's the ability to um, make your own decisions um, in very uh, authoritarian societies. You can't make your own decisions a lot. Um, and I often talk about the United States as being the country in the world that has, uh, because of our debate and so on, we've achieved the highest aspiration of the spirit. Uh, because uh, even though our warts are uh, spread around the world on television every night and we there are plenty of them the fact is we have a society here where we all live in peace uh, for the most part I mean you you hear about the exceptions and the eruptions uh, in the news but um, you know by and large we have a society here of 310 million people who are from every uh, race country religion, creed, you name it, in the world, um, and we all call ourselves Americans, and by and large we live in peace and are able to uh, do what we want, I mean, within reason, and obviously we have um, rules uh, that are intended to protect us all, things like uh, uh, speed laws and <laughs> how the traffic system works and so on so um, you can't have total free will um, but there's a trade-off it's a middle way there's not a there's not a central answer and um, which uh, reminds me of a question that I uh, was asked um, uh, I think by Miles, perhaps, where he asked me about um, the, and I, uh, Miles, I apologize for sharing this with the, with the group, but I think um, he'll approve. Uh, Miles asked me about this um, diagram, which appears in Edward Edinger's book, The Ion Lectures, and uh, he asked me whether as you go f deeper and deeper toward the self is that does that get you to truth or the ultimate truth I think that was your question and the problem is that um, if if you don't have any shadow uh, and you go to the singularity, as I think Miles put it, um, then you also don't have anything. <laughs> and so um, there has to be a middle way um, between the ego and the self. The, uh, the Buddhists want to go directly to the self through meditation. And um, that hasn't worked very well for them in my view because they have abject poverty and they're dominated by the Chinese and so going to the, to the self end of the spectrum uh, from a spiritual point of view uh, doesn't isn't a good way to live um, and uh, you know it means you can cope maybe um, but but it doesn't mean it's a good way to live in the 21st century, in my view, but that's just me yakking here. Um, let's see. 
CJ Law asks, uh, are all artists tapping into the collective unconscious? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I would say all, and it depends on your definition of artist, um, but if they're truly artists, um, then yes, I think that they are. Um, you know, we have a uh, adult education uh, operation here called Maryland Hall. It, it's the old high school, um, and when they integrated the schools back in the late 50s in Maryland, uh, they had a they had, had separate high schools for white children and black children, and when they integrated, they had to build a new school to support that, and so the old white high school was given to the state and it's become a center for the arts so every classroom is for a different art and um, I've taken many uh, classes there and you can go in and uh, you can see a lot of uh, people especially older people taking art classes and they're all trying to become a camera to um, make the perfect image of a still life or a nude or whatever it is that they're painting or drawing or whatever it is and you know that's not the point because we have cameras for that now uh, we don't need people you know with the exception of Trump lay, lay people who are uh, painters who can fool the eye and make you think you're actually looking at a scene you know, there are painters that are that good and that detailed. Um, and it, you don't even think you're looking at a photograph. You think you're looking at the actual scene with Trump Loy. But aside from that, um, you know, there's no point in trying to paint a picture of something that you could just as well take a photograph of. Um, but what you need to do as an artist, in my view, is find out what's coming from the unconscious and whether it's your personal unconscious or the collective unconscious, I couldn't say, but that's where it needs to come from. And if you do that, then you're, it's real art. And I've discussed in my group a few times where in one class I was taking the uh, teacher would come up behind me and say, no, you have to do it this way. And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> That's the way she does it, but that, that isn't my way. And, and you know, th this is the type of freedom that Dr. Jung and Otto Gross were talking about, where you can't have culture telling you that you know, if you're going to do a portrait of someone, it has to be done in this way. Okay, that's very uh, destructive um, because that isn't my objective. Okay, and uh, sometime in the future, I might uh, show you one of my self portraits, which contains within it everything I have to say about the Vietnam War, um, but not today. Um, and um, so, let's see, Clive asks, how does that link with an individual? Um, you know, in the end, you just have to feel it, Clive, um, because um, like anything, and I do agree with uh, Dr. Goldstein about this from the from the Wycliffe College Convocation, um, you have to get out into life. You know, I really loved going to school. I spent 10 years going to higher education at the university level, 10 years, and I loved going to school. But that's not life. That's only uh, teaching you the rules and putting the jungle gym in place for you. But then you have to get, get on the jungle gym and start swinging around. and. So if you want to be an artist, you have to start doing it, and ultimately you'll become a good one. Um, 
Clive, is the concept of value more or less useful to a meaningful life? Um, I would have to say your personal value certainly uh, it, it will probably make things meaningful to you. Um, you know, I, I couldn't say more than that, I don't think. Uh, Miles says, this is great. Now I have learned art appreciation today as well. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad of it. Uh, folks, it's uh, been two hours now, and um, I don't think YouTube will let me have this video online much longer than that. So I'm going to terminate this for now, and um, we'll go ahead and... Uh, think about what will be uh, for the future um, and um, uh, you know I'll try to do at least one more Q&A session before my surgery a week from today it, it may not be until Monday or something uh, but in any case um, uh, let me uh, leave you with um, this f famous quote of Dr. Jung, and um, thank you all for your good wishes about my uh, recovery. I appreciate that very much, and uh, I'll do my best to be with you as soon as possible. I, I, there will probably be limitations on how long I can stay online, considering that I'll have to keep my uh, foot raised for six weeks, so I don't know how long I'll be able to sit at the computer, but in any case, uh, I'll leave you with these words, and thank you for joining me today. Here are Dr. Jung's uh, words from his famous quote. Clive, an answer to your question about when the next Q&A will be. I'm sorry, I don't uh, have a clear idea of that. Um, but if you look at whatever you're looking at, you've followed a link to watch this event. And when I decide when it will be, uh, you will find a notice on this link about when the next event is. That's where uh, YouTube allows me to publish it. Uh, Lady Shea, you said that quote brought tears to my eyes. Which quote are we talking about? You're talking about this quote that's on the screen now? Ah, yes, okay. Well, there's there are more quotes at the earlier part of this video, but you'll have to watch those. And so thank you everyone for joining me. I very much appreciate your participation in this uh, discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.